There are few styles of wrestling more exciting to watch than Lucha. After all, with its acrobatic and high-flying feel, it makes it hard to turn away from the screen. Of course, this has led to a lot of wrestlers from outside Mexico also picking it up and making it their own, and the stars of WWE have been no exception to this. Yes, for decades now, New York has been home to some of the best athletes in the world, but who are the best of the best? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today, so join us as we take a deep dive into Aerial Assassins, WWE's greatest high flyers. And if we want to find one of the earliest examples of this phenomenon in a WWF ring, we have to travel all the way back to the early 80s, the days before Hulkamania existed. But who could have been capable of putting on such an athletic body of work back then? Why, none other than Jimmy Snuka, of course. Yes, after spending the decade prior building his name on the territory circuit, Superfly Jimmy Snuka joined Vince McMahon's promotion in 1982 and there quickly wowed fans with what he was capable of and this meant filling his matches with lots of high-flying action, the likes of which most had never seen. But then why would they have? After all, before Snuka came along, New York was the land of slower, more lumbering big men like Bruno Sammartino and superstar Billy Graham. So when a seemingly gravity-defying man from Fiji appeared and showed audiences a whole new world, it quickly turned him into the biggest star the promotion had. Seriously, before Hulk Hogan became the top babyface under Vince McMahon, it was Jimmy Snuka who fans held closest to their hearts. And this was a love which was only fostered more when he went up against heels like Ray Stevens, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and Don Morocco. Hell, during a steel cage bout with the latter, in fact, Superfly forever etched his name in history when he performed a big splash off the top of the cage and inspired a young man in the audience named Mick Foley to try out this whole wrestling thing for himself. Sadly though, as the mid-80s rolled around, Snooka's star had fallen somewhat due to the introduction of far more popular figures like the Hulkster and Macho Man Randy Savage. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the fact he was implicated in the death of his girlfriend Nancy Argentino in 1983 meant management would have to be a lot more careful about pushing him going forward, in case it became apparent he'd murdered her. So, with all these factors coming together to make things extra difficult, Snuka made the decision to leave WWF in 1985. And while he would return again for a while in the early 90s, most notably to be the first victim of The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak, most now remember him for the pioneering work he did in bringing high-flying wrestling to New York. But even if he was arguably the first, it doesn't mean he was the best high-flyer to ever work for Vince McMahon. No, there are plenty of other performers who can hold the claim to that crown. And if we're looking at direct descendants of the Lucha style, we really don't have to look any further than with a member of the famed Guerrero family themselves, Eddie Guerrero. That's right, as the son of the iconic Gory Guerrero, creator of the Camel Clutch, Eddie had big shoes to fill when he started wrestling in the mid-80s. So it's just as well he turned out to be an absolute prodigy then, someone who could outshine just about anyone he shared a ring with. And while this was apparent during his time with WCW, ECW, AAA, and New Japan Pro Wrestling, it all reached another level once he joined WWF in 2000. Why was that? Well, now with a bigger audience than ever watching his matches, Latino Heat got to turn himself into one of the most beloved fan favorites in modern memory. Hell, even when he was supposed to be a sleazy heel, one who lied, cheated, and stole his way to victory, his charms were so magnetic that audiences couldn't help but falling in love with him. But it wasn't just his charisma which drew them to the Texas native. No, they were also wowed by his high-flying skills. And why wouldn't they be? Because these were so impressive, they continued to stand out even when Eddie was in the depths of drug addiction. Of course, for most men, such addiction would have eventually caused their in-ring talents to subside. But luckily, in Eddie's case, he was eventually able to get them under control and from there become an arguably even better wrestler. And that was how, in what probably ranks as his greatest moment, he'd use his high-flying athletics to get the better of Brock Lesnar at February 15, 2004's No Way Out and become WWE Champion. Yes, it was a feel-good moment which only Mick Foley or Daniel Bryan's big title wins can really compete with, and as such, it's one which will be remembered forever. That said, it's not the only time an underdog high flyer has had a huge title win in WWE, as years later in 2019, Kofi Kingston made his case for being one of the best when he did exactly the same thing. But part of the reason this was so powerful was because, for over a decade prior, Kingston had been one of the most underappreciated wrestlers on the roster, someone who every fan knew was incredibly talented, but who was never seen by management as any more than mid-card. 
Still, even if he'd never rose above intercontinental title level, the Ghanaian-born star continued to put out great matches on a regular basis, whether this be in the singles division against the likes of Randy Orton, or in tag team action alongside his New Day stablemates Big E and Xavier Woods. And it was this very consistency which eventually led management to trust him when, after he caught fire following a breakout performance at February 2019's Elimination Chamber, fans suddenly started demanding he be in the WrestleMania main event. Of course, you all know what happens next. Kofi Mania ran wild and Kingston beat Daniel Bryan at the Showcase of the Immortals to become WWE Champion. But while this was a great moment in a vacuum, make no mistake, the only reason it ever got to that point was because Kofi had been such a great high-flying wrestler for such a long time, everyone believed in him when the time came. Hell, they continue to believe in him today, in fact, even if he's for the most part returned to the tag team division, as he proved to everyone on the roster that with enough persistence and hard work, you can get your moment. No doubt another incredibly skilled high flyer currently stuck on the SmackDown midcard has been taking careful notes then, because when it comes to someone like Ricochet, all he needs is an opportunity and he'll show everyone exactly how good he is. And yes, most hardcore fans have long been aware of what Trevor Mann can do, as he's already proven himself to be a human highlight reel in the likes of PWG, Dragon Gate, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Lucha Underground. In fact, there, he's had some generational classics against the likes of Will Ospreay and Ray Phoenix, bouts which at times appeared to defy the laws of physics. As far as WWE audiences are concerned, though, they've only had a taste of what he's capable of thus far. And that's what makes his future so potentially bright, because while he's shown some very impressive acrobatic skills during his time on NXT where he served as North American Champion, and then on the main roster where he's been both a United States Champion and Intercontinental Champion, the moment he really gets let off the leash, it'll be another story altogether. Why is this? Well, there's quite literally no one else who can do what he can do in the modern day. Really, when he's at his best, it's like watching a man wrestling on the moon one who's fully aware he's no longer bound by gravity. Yes, it's scary to think that, while he's already done enough to earn himself a spot on this list, he's still got so much more left in the tank, and because of that, by the time he's done, he might just end up being the greatest high flyer of all time. Hell, we wouldn't even be surprised to see him eventually become a world champion under Triple H, and if we're really lucky, we might still get treated to watching him work a program with another of the greatest high flyers in WWE history, and that's none other than Rey Mysterio. Now, we don't have to tell you who Rey Mysterio is. After all, not only is he one of the best luchadors of all time, he's one of the greatest wrestlers in general. How did he reach this level, though? Well, by stealing the show everywhere he went, whether that be in the likes of AAA, CMLL, ECW, WCW, or perhaps most famously, WWE. That's right, while Ray was already well known as being one of the greatest athletes of his generation by the time he made it to New York in 2002, it was the additional exposure here which took him to another level altogether. And this meant the largely Hispanic audience of SmackDown got a new hero to watch every week as they saw the diminutive star prove someone at only 5'6 in height could be a top guy. Of course, even with his generation-defining high-flying skills in display here, it still took a while for Mysterio to convince Vince McMahon he could be at that level. But over time, with an aerial offense which no one could match, and a growing fan base of fans both young and old on his side, he was able to get the boss on board to the point that, in 2005, he'd win the Royal Rumble and then go on to become World Heavyweight Champion at WrestleMania 22. And sure, the title reign which followed turned out to be a bit of a mess, but that was no fault of Ray's. No, it was his booking that was the culprit here, something he proved by continuing to be excellent for years after the fact. In fact, when his career appeared to be winding down in the mid-2010s, stem cell therapy on his knees reinvigorated the Lucha star to the point where he was able to move like a man 20 years his junior. And this meant that, after a spell working for AAA and Lucha Underground, when he returned to WWE in 2018, he was able to keep up with the current generation of performers like Andrade and AJ Styles. The only question is, now how much longer can he keep going for? Will he continue on for a while yet, or will he ultimately hand the mantle over to his son Dominic sooner rather than later? I guess we'll just have to wait and see, but either way, he's secured his spot in the history books regardless. And he's not the only former Extreme Championship Wrestling star in this video as it happens, because while Ray is no doubt a legend, beloved by all, even he might argue Rob Van Dam is just as good, if not better. Sure, that's certainly a bold statement and one you can all discuss in the comments below, 
there's really no right or wrong answer, it's all down to personal opinion. One thing we can be sure of though is that even if you don't rank him as the absolute best, RVD has to be among the all-time great high flyers in WWE history. And that's because, if nothing else, he was an ECW original who managed to make it all the way to the top of the mountain under Vince McMahon. Yes, the Sandman, Taz, Tommy Dreamer, and Raven, great as they were, certainly weren't breaking through that glass ceiling. Why was this? Well, in the boss's mind, the Extreme Philly promotion always had the stink of being something far more low-rent than what he pictured the industry as. So that's why it's so impressive that after joining WWE in 2001 as part of the invasion angle, Van Damme quickly got over with not only fans, but with Vince himself. Don't believe us? Just take a look at the fact that after only three months on the roster, he was main eventing pay-per-views with Kurt Angle and Steve Austin. That said, for as much as fans might have wanted it at this point, one line McMahon wasn't going to cross was to put the world title on the Michigan native. No, if he wanted to earn this honor, he'd have to fight much harder. Luckily then, RVD was more than up to the task as, picking up right where he left off in ECW, he'd changed the game with his innovative in-ring skills which mixed high-flying lucha with martial arts. Yes, anyone who was a fan at the time will no doubt remember being wowed when they first saw him go coast to coast with a Van Terminator or show us exactly what could be done with the cage during the original Elimination Chamber match. And eventually, this impressive body of work even got the boss on board too, as at June 2006's One Night Stand pay-per-view, Mr. Monday Night beat John Cena to become not only the WWE Champion, but also the new ECW World Champion. Sadly though, his penchant for getting high would come back to bite him here, as after getting caught driving to a show with a bag of weed in his car not long thereafter, Van Damme would be suspended and, as a result, would have to quickly drop both belts. But even if this signaled the end of his main event run, it didn't damage his reputation in fans' eyes at all. No, all they cared about was watching him continue to pull off athletic feats that few could match. Of course, for as great as he was though, there were still a few others on the roster at the same time who could challenge RVD for the title of most innovative high flyer, and of those names, perhaps none stood out from the pack quite as much as the charismatic enigma himself, Jeff Hardy. But really, what Jeff was doing predated Van Damme's time in WWE, because as far back as 1999, he and his brother Matt were reinventing tag team wrestling for a new generation alongside the likes of the Dudley Boys, Edge, and Christian. And while Matt has since been considered the better creative mind of the two, there remains no doubt who the most influential actual wrestler was because watching Jeff Hardy perform death-defying stunts on a regular basis at the turn of the millennium led to a generation of younger stars taking to the ring for the first time. Seriously, without Jeff Hardy, we wouldn't have the likes of the Young Bucks or Darby Allin today. And it wasn't just his tag team wrestling which inspired them either. No, after realizing how big of a star he had on his hands, Vince McMahon broke Jeff away into the singles division in the early 2000s and there pushed him to the moon. Sadly though, these pushes often never went as well as they should have on account of the youngest Hardy's continued substance abuse issues. But even if this did shackle him down somewhat, it was never enough to hold him to the ground fully, as whenever a tall structure was nearby, you could be sure Jeff Hardy was going to find a way to jump off of it. Hell, so crazy was he that audiences couldn't help but be glued to their screens whenever he was on. And this at one point even translated to him briefly becoming the number one merch seller in the entire company, more so than John Cena, in fact. It's just a shame he couldn't keep his demons under control then, as for as high as he went, who knows how much higher he might have gone had things been different. Maybe we'd even be talking about him on the same level as someone who's widely regarded to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest wrestler of all time, and that's Shawn Michaels. Yes, the heartbreak kid has rightfully earned his spot on the Mount Rushmore of wrestling, as he was someone who, in the 90s, was able to take his peerless high-flying skills and become, at times, the only person worth talking about. And once he was done spending that decade having instant classics against the likes of Bret Hart, Razor Ramon, and The Undertaker, he then had an arguably even bigger second run during the 2000s where he upped the game against Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle, Triple H, and countless others. But what was it that made him stand out so much? After all, there were a lot of great high flyers in WWE by this point. Well, when it came to Sean, not only was he incredibly athletically gifted, but he also had the ring IQ needed to craft some of the best matches ever with his talents. Sometimes this was done through means of innovation, as was the case with the groundbreaking ladder match against Razor Ramon or Hell in a Cell match against The Undertaker during his first turn, 
and sometimes it was just done through sheer bare-bones storytelling, something which can be seen in each of his WrestleMania classics with the Dead Man in the late 2000s. Of course, for anyone else then, this would be enough to merit giving them a slot on this video alone, but for HBK it's only scratching the surface of his resume. Yes, if we really wanted to, we could make mention of the hidden gems he had against folks like Mankind and Shelton Benjamin. And as if that weren't enough, there's also the fact that pretty much every high-flying young wrestler today was in some way inspired to get into the business by him. And one of the people inspired is our next entry as it happens. Not that this person is defined by being a Heartbreak Kid clone in any way, because when it comes to John Morrison, his parkour-inflected offense owes a debt to no one. Still though, at least during his early days, the Man of a Thousand Names career mirrored his heroes anyway when Morrison started out his run in WWE during the mid-2000s as something of a tag team specialist. Yes, whether that be alongside Joey Mercury as part of Eminem or teaming with The Miz after that, the Californian's first chance to shine on the big stage came while paired up with others. But that all changed by the time the late 2000s rolled around as then, moving over to singles competition, Morrison proved he had what it took when he won the Intercontinental title on three separate occasions. And with this singles push came an increased awareness of his abilities by management, something which led them to trusting him enough to put him in pretty much every ladder match which took place thereafter. That's right, if you needed a reliable high flyer to get the crowd excited, you could always count on John Morrison, but it wasn't just ladder matches he excelled at, because anything which required a spectacular style of offense was well within his wheelhouse. Hell, even when he left WWE and went on to work for the likes of Impact, Lucha Underground, and AAA, he remained one of the highlights of any card he was on. And when in 2019 he made his comeback to the place which had first brought him fame, he proved he hadn't lost a step, with him still, even at that point, being able to outshine almost everyone else around him. Unfortunately though, since then, Morrison has left WWE again to go ply his craft elsewhere. Thankfully, the same can't be said for our next entry today, however, as when it comes to Shelton Benjamin, he remains in New York, showing everyone why he's one of the best high flyers of his generation. But wait, we hear you ask, surely the gold standard skill lay in his crisp mat work. Well, yeah, he has that in spades, but what made him stand out so much was that he wasn't just limited to this. No, when called upon, Benjamin could also take to the air in a way that would have made most high flyers blush. And it was this jack-of-all-trades style which allowed him to be slotted into any spot required and excel once there. It didn't matter if it was as part of a tag team with Charlie Haas as a singles wrestler fighting over the Intercontinental Championship or as a member of the Hurt Business stable, few, if any, were able to keep up with him when he was at his best. Of course, this should have been evident to anyone who was paying attention as far back as 2000 though, because there, amongst an Ohio Valley wrestling class which also included John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Dave Batista, and Randy Orton, Shelton still managed to make his presence felt. And when he made it up to the main roster a couple of years later then, he continued to stand out as one of the key mid-card acts on both SmackDown and Raw, with him becoming a three-time Intercontinental Champion and one-time United States Champion during this time, as well as a two-time Tag Team Champion as well. In fact, his first run with the former belt would go so well that it ended up lasting for 244 days, making it the longest reign of that decade. But it's not just his ability to win gold which earns Shelton a spot on this list. No, it's also the way he managed to create some truly magic moments, such as his often show-stealing roles in the early Money in the Bank ladder matches, or the time he took the greatest sweet chin music of all time from Shawn Michaels in 2004. And while many of his peers since then have wound down their careers, he has continued to go on strong, proving that the gold standard is more than just a nickname to him. It's a way of life.